I'm not going to speak here so much about my own contributions, but about those of the whole group that I represent. And that is the CLIA VUB group. VUB stands for Vrije Universiteit Brussel, which means Free University of Brussels. And what CLIA is, we will immediately explain. So CLIA is um, as an abbreviation of the Centre Leo Apostol. And uh, it's a transdisciplinary research group. Transdisciplinary means that we really bridge all the disciplines. We do not belong to any particular department or faculty. We are kind of in between different uh, faculties at the university in Brussels. And that group was founded in 1995 in honor of the philosopher Leo Apostle. So it was also the, the year that Apostle died, but he kind of defined the mission of the center. And because Apostle was a famous philosopher who got kind of the equivalent of the local Belgian Nobel Prize, he decided to donate the money of that prize to the university in order to create this kind of center. So what is our mission? First of all, construction of integrated worldviews. So what is a worldview? A worldview is a view on the total. We don't mean worldview so much in the meaning of the particular perspective of a particular group. A worldview is really something that is a kind of an encompassing meaning giving system that answers all the big questions. Where do we come from? Where are we going to? What is the world? How can we know things? Which values should we follow? How should we act? Uh, and why do we need such integrated worldview? It was because Apostle noted that the world is uh, characterized by a fragmentation of knowledge, especially in sciences. You have the disciplines and subdisciplines and ever more specialized domains and ever more specialized theories. And that creates a sense not only of fragmentation, but of this whole VUCA world things are uncertain, things are confused, things are ambiguous, people feel alienated, they have no longer a sense of meaning. So what the world view in the sense of Apostle is supposed to do is to provide an answer to all these questions, to provide an encompassing picture of the whole. And what Apostle also wanted was that not only we would try to integrate the results from the different disciplines, the scientific, the academic disciplines, but that we would also provide deep dissemination. So in that respect, our, well, our uh, approach is very similar to one of the human energy project. So at the moment, our group, it's about 30 affiliated researchers. I mean, you can't really count because there are people coming in, coming out, people that are working state for us, people that are affiliated, people that are there part of the time it's difficult to say, it does not have very clear boundaries. On our, on our website, you can see a list of names, but some names are missing there, and maybe some names that are there are no longer there. So it's a little bit of a problem in general with uh, research department, but especially in ours, because it is so wide ranging. And I think that is the interesting part about our center, and that I think is what makes it really unique, is that you find people there from all possible backgrounds. So that means the physical sciences, the biological sciences, the technological sciences and engineering, the social sciences, the humanities. So you will have people with a background in philosophy, in psychology, in economics, in physics, in medicine. You really find a very broad range of people. And what's also, I think, interesting is that uh, most of these people, they're not Belgians. It's a center in Belgium, in Brussels, which is the capital of Belgium. But most of these people have come there because somewhere on the internet, they found our work, they were interested, especially my publications have made quite an impression on lots of people over the course of the decades. And these people then typically send me an email. And if, if I have the impression that's an interesting person, I invite them and then they give a seminar. And sometimes they remain to make a PhD or sometimes they do a postdoc or they uh, are affiliated in some other way. So in that sense, it's a very interesting bunch of people. And that means that we are lucky to have some very talented people with very diverse backgrounds. And some of these people, I will now present their work uh, here. So what is our guiding philosophy? So we have this philosophy that we want to build a, an integrated worldview, but what is the foundation of that worldview? That is the idea that the universe is an evolving system, so evolution, obviously, and complexity that 
through evolution, we become more and more complex. So matter, life, intelligence, consciousness, society, all these kind of levels of organization, we see this emerge to a process of self-organization. So there is no, the, the, the idea is not that there is some imposed blueprint either by some God that has designed the universe, nor by some kind of laws of nature that are there and that are determining everything. The, uh, the, the, the view is really self-organization, things spontaneously assemble what uh, I just heard they are called self-assembly. The second principle of our philosophy is what we call thinking beyond boundaries. So this transdisciplinarity, that means that you go beyond the boundaries between disciplines. In science, you typically have physics is about, about matter at the level of particles, and then chemistry about level, uh, matter at the level of molecules, and biology is about matter at the level of cells, and then you have psychology and sociology, etc. Et we, we do not want to take into account these boundaries. So, the people, whatever background they are, they are typically working on more than one of these different domains. So we believe that research should not be restricted to existing ideologies, paradigms, theories. Uh, we need to include as many different perspectives as possible. Also, in practical problems, we need to take into account different stakeholders. So we put a lot of emphasis on this free thinking attitude, this uh, thinking beyond boundaries attitude. And thinking beyond boundaries means both thinking that is creative, that means out of the box, and thinking that is critical. That means you can have all kinds of wild ideas, but in the end, you should be ready to criticize your own ideas and to reject them if it turns out that they don't work. So some examples of things we have been doing research on, of course, on the internet as a global brain, may be less well known. That's a different group on which I'm indirectly connected uh, quantum cognition, that to say, looking at cognitive processes in the brain as if they were quantum processes. Happiness and well-being, cognition and consciousness, uh, how can we educate people into thinking, cybernetics and complex adaptive systems, that's more my speciality. A more recent project is the origins of goal directedness, which is also the idea of the origin of life. What is the first goal directed kind of organization? And uh, uh, quite recently, uh, what we call art science, which is a kind of a attempt to merge the methods of art and science. And we have a number of artists working with us that are quite well informed in science, but also we have scientists that are uh, artists, uh, maybe not at the professional level. So some of our achievements, well, uh, in those uh, 25, you know, almost 30 years that we exist, we, according to the database of the VUB, so I don't know how precise it is. We have some 2,000 scientific publications. Lots of these got lots of citations. Uh, we are uh, publishing our own journal called Foundations of Science, which is a so-called Web of Science journal, which means that it has an impact factor. We also organize some 20 research sem seminars each year. Uh, we record the seminars on our YouTube channel, and these are long, difficult, <coughs> scientific topics, but they get quite a lot of views. And we have a number of uh, funded projects, and that is always a problem in science. It's not easy to get funded. So we were lucky to get some big funds from the Templeton Foundation, from uh, the Milner Foundation. But as always, when you do, especially this kind of research that's out of the borders, outside of the typical boundaries, it's difficult to get money for that. To give you an idea of the kind of thing we have been doing before we knew that human energy existed, these are some of our uh, representative publications that are related to human energy, like the, 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 the first book, World Use from Fragmentation to Integration, it's a bit our defining program of this construction of integrated world use. Uh, there are some of my uh, publications, uh, I don't need to go into all that, just to give you an idea that we have been busy with these things well before there was the Human Energy Project. And so you see some of the names of people that will be here today, like Lenartovich is Marta, Beji is Shima, but there are also other people like Kadar Last or John Stewart, who 
are or were affiliated with us sometimes who have also been writing on the global brain, on evolutionary integration and so on. So we are with four people here, myself included, which are all very uh, good people in the sense that they know this domain quite well. But it's, I wouldn't say the tip of the iceberg, but I mean there are more people like that in our center. So Ben asked me to speak about uh, how we got involved into human energy, and that happened, I think, like with several other people at the conference IS4IS, which uh, Terry organized in Berkeley, and where he introduced me to Ben, and uh, Ben seemed quite impressed by my global brain research, that's why he wanted to meet me and to uh, discuss about it. And well, we immediately discovered that we agreed about our main interest, that means Neurosphere global brain, most obviously, but also the techno-social dilemma, which is another uh, form of what Apostle called this alienation, fragmentation, and the need for developing a third story, which is what Apostle calls an integrated worldview. It's the same idea, something that is not just scientific, but something that also gives meaning, something that also has values in it. So we started to collaborate. Uh, so. Human Energy has funded some of our research, but on the other hand, we have also done our own research without uh, uh, Human Energy funding, precisely because the two topics are so close that, yeah, you can't really say which one is for Human Energy, which one is for Clea in general. It's all very close. So then I will uh, review the contributions uh, specifically that we have done to human energy since the beginning. And I think the, maybe the most obvious one, that's mostly the work of Clément Vidal, which I will go into more detail later, was an update and clarification of Teilhard's vision of the Neurosphere and making the link with my own older work on the superorganism, the global superorganism, the global brain. Uh, more recently, I will hopefully have the time to speak about it. I have provided a new conceptual foundation, which I call relational agency. Another important new idea we had that work that I did mostly with Shima here, that's Neurospheric Consciousness, that's applying neuroscientific theories to the internet. And then the work more that Martha has been doing, that's thinking into the Neurosphere, so teaching people how to think as part of the Neurosphere. And then an ongoing research, which I'm doing with Clement, are the ethical foundations. So here are the uh, four people present here at uh, the workshop. And I'll go in a bit more detail about each of them. So myself, my background is actually in theoretical physics, but I can't say I, I'm working in theoretical physics, but it also it, it means that I have a certain mathematical background that makes me confident to speak about all kinds of highly sophisticated stuff like quantum theory and so on. But actually what I'm more specialized in is what's called complex adaptive systems, and specifically from the point of view of cybernetics and cognition, that means how does our mind function. So I am at the moment the director of the Centre Le Apostle that is actually not that long ago, that's about four years I think. Mm -hmm. uh, my predecessor uh, Diederik Kaert, he's still active but well he retired so he couldn't officially remain the director. Uh, I'm a member uh, first of the advisory board of human energy and now uh, uh, since short, since a few weeks ago also of the scientific uh, steering committee. And so what would I say if I had to summarize my own major contribution? It is this theory of major evolutionary transitions. Uh, that's kind of the terminology nowadays in evolution. We used to call it meta-system transitions, but basically it means the same thing. So I think you know by now what the major evolutionary transition is, but within that major evolutionary transition, my approach is a bit different, I would say, from the evolutionary biologist like uh, David. It's a complex adaptive systems approach, which is specifically uh, uh, looking at self-organization. So here I put just a few uh, recent publications specifically on the Human Energy Project. 
the first one is just a commentary on the paper of David. Then the relational agency, which is, I think, a very important paper. And I hope there will be time to speak a little bit more about it. And then the third one will be an, a, a more popular version, which we are still working on. So another person of my group that's here is uh, Shima Beji, who is uh, from an Iranian background originally, but who has uh, gotten the Belgian nationality. She's originally educated in engineering, but now is an entrepreneur who has just started her own company, uh, Thai uh, Tea. Uh, I, I think her important contribution is what she calls mindfulness engineering, which is a kind of a strategy for developing smart cities. And she has collaborated with me on Noospheric Consciousness, and we have applied that in particular uh, to COVID. Uh, COVID is not only a global disease of the body, it's in a sense there was also a disease of the mind in the sense that during the COVID pandemic, you had all these conspiracy theories circulating that were telling people not to get vaccinated because vaccines were a conspiracy by, for example, Bill Gates in order to inject microchips into bodies that would collect data. Uh, we have looked at some of these examples just to show that there are also pathologies of the noosphere. Uh, but I think the important concept that we were trying to speak about is the idea of consciousness in the noosphere. And consciousness, there are by now a number of quite advanced theories of consciousness in neuroscience. And we looked at three of those, the global workspace, um, the information integration theory, and the adaptive resonance. And we showed that actually, if you abstract from the specific neurons doing the work, you can find similar complex dynamics in the North Sea, that is to say, in the uh, messages that uh, circulate on the internet. Uh, then Clément Vidal. Clément is actually the one who, from our group, who first started working specifically on the Human Energy Project. Uh, He's French, uh, he's, uh, he has a degree in philosophy, and he's working on cosmology, world use, and nowadays extraterrestrial intelligence. So that is why at the moment he's no longer working uh, at our center, he's working here in Berkeley at the SETI Institute. So he has collaborated with me, among others, on the ethics of technology, but what he mostly did for the Human Energy Project is that he reviewed, summarized, and kind of tried to update Teya's concept of the Noosphere. It was a topic that was very close to the heart of Ben, the famous chapter 10. What Clément has been doing is he has been going through chapter 10 and looked at everything Teya said. I don't remember how many years, more than half a century ago, and then compared it with the present understanding that we have and noted in how far it's correct. Most of it is correct, and a few things you can have questions about. So that's what Clément has been doing. And he also has been making this very nice fact kind of uh, document, what is the North here, which is on the Human Energy website, which summarizes uh, what the North Sphere is in a way which I think puts all the important things in an understandable way. And uh, most recently, he has also uh, written a paper, Extending Planetary Health, uh, where he is combining this idea of the North Sphere with the general pro pro problems of the planet, sustainability, etc. And then the last member of our team who is present here at the workshop is Marta Lanartovic, who comes from Poland, but is now also living in Belgium. Originally, her background is in philology and in humanistic management. And in our center, she is the director of education. That means she has started up a number of education pro projects, of which the most uh, developed as yet is the School of Thinking, which is a postgraduate which teaches people to think. And uh, it does that in a quite original way. You get an overview of different philosophical, cognitive, uh, psychological, and other theories of thinking. But you also have a lot of exercises where people have to debate, have to discuss, have to read papers. So they are really trained into thinking. And the students seem to love it, because most of them 
after the program is finished, they kind of hang around and they continue participating in activities. So we are kind of creating a community. What's particularly interesting in that program is that it reaches a particular group of people that's kind of not well served anywhere else. That means people who are professionals, who are smart people, but who feel intellectually insufficiently challenged within their work. They're working, let's say, in a bank, or maybe they're a doctor, or maybe they are making videos. But they have kind of a feeling like, yeah, I would like to go more <coughs> deeply into things. And then when they meet others like that in the school of thinking, and they can effectively do that, they get very motivated and they want to keep informed. And I think this is also a very important public to attract into this notion of the neurosphere and the human in, uh, in, uh, energy project. So one of the things she did with those people uh, that was just a few months ago, she organized a five day long neurosphere outside in workshop where every week there was a whole afternoon in which different topics were discussed topics about the AI, about the global brain, et cetera. But I, I'm sure she will tell you more about that when she gives her talk uh, herself. And in terms of publications, uh, she has developed this notion that she calls cognitive interiorization, which is the idea that you put into your mind the idea of how somebody else would look at it. So it's a kind of an intellectual empathy if you want to think as a nurse, you should not just think from your own perspective, you should also try to think from the perspective of the other person. But I, I, I assume she will speak about that more tomorrow. So she wrote down that concept in a, a paper called The Method of Humanity, which is in a book that she's uh, editing together with another person, uh, Jesse Eggers. So let me speak a little bit about the future work that I see that our group could be doing for human energy. So. First of all, there is this idea of education for the neurosphere, but this is something Martha will explain uh, tomorrow. Martha has now expanded from teaching a postgraduate course for people who already have a master's degree to uh, going to uh, mid-school levels, 12 to 18 years. But then I would say the most important thing that I and I think most people would like to do is what I would call a scientific foundation for the third story. So I spoke about this relational agency theory and the collective consciousness. What I would also like to do is to link with a number of other contemporary movements and philosophies that have been coming up, especially these last few decades, with people who are not yet thinking in terms of neurosphere, but who have a certain sympathy towards what I would call global holistic views, uh, domains like ecology, post-humanism, actor network theory. I will speak a little bit about it later. And then also we want to work on ethics and the socio-technological socio dilemma, which has always been a theme in the center layer apostle, but where specifically I would like to develop a value system for the internet age for the technological systems. So since I have a bit more time, I will try to give you a kind of a brief view of what I call relational agency. So a relational agency, it's a new term. I wrote a paper with that title a year ago. It's finally going to be published apparently. Uh, the idea is a bit older. I started discussing it with Shima and with others. And the idea is that instead of looking at organisms and superorganisms, you look at agents and the relationships with other agents, and then the relationships between agents can become super agents. So what is an agent? An agent can be almost anything that acts. So that makes it in a sense easier than speaking about organisms. An aunt could be an agent, a cell could be an agent, an institution could be an agent, a robot could be an agent, but actually even an atom can be an agent. The way I define it, anything that interacts with other things can be described as an agent. And these agents interact because whenever one agent acts, that means it changes something in its environment and that will have an effect on whichever other agent is in that same environment. 
So that's that other agent observing the result of the action will be challenged to act. So I call this propagation of challenge. A challenge for me is not something negative. Challenge can be negative, can be positive. A challenge is something that incites an agent to act. A challenge challenges you to do something. So one agent acts, it creates a situation that either is a problem for another agent or is an opportunity for another agent, but that second agent then is inclined to act in turn, which creates a challenge for one or more other agents, and like that, challenges propagate, like I post something on the internet and somebody reacts to it, and then somebody reacts to the reaction, and then somebody posts that reaction to another uh, uh, forum, and so on, things tend to propagate. So the idea is that you have a propagation of activity, and this propagation may either die down and stop, or it may become self-sustaining. So self-sustaining propagations of challenges, that means that at some moment you get an interaction pattern that becomes stabilized, and a stabilized interaction pattern I call a relationship, like uh, I need something, I ask it to you, and you give it to me, and I'm happy with what you gave me, and then I need it again, and I again ask it to you, and you again give it to me. After a while, we establish a relationship that I know that whenever I need this particular thing or this particular help, I can ask you, and you know that if you want my help for something, you can ask it to me. So a relationship is a kind of a stabilized interaction where two agents develop a stable, synergetic connection. So, and it is these connections that stabilize, that produce then an organization, and that for me is the basis of self-organization. Why do I speak about agents? Actually, because in science there is already for a while a uh, attempt of what are called agent-based models. That's a method of computer simulation that turns out to be extremely handy for complex systems. What you do is, instead of describing a complex system as a whole of differential equations with different variables that are the one dependent on the other, if you do it like that, very soon it becomes unsolvable. Even the biggest computer can't solve it. So what do they do? They define agents, which are things that, dis that use so-called condition action rules. The agent notices a particular condition, and in that condition it knows to perform a particular action. So agents are basically collections of rules, and the rules tell the agent, if you perceive this situation, then you do that action. And that action typically creates a new condition, which then makes another agent act, so challenges propagate, and the agents become dynamical systems, you get the dynamics of complex interactions, and these are the famous multi-agent si simulations where the agents could be people on the stock exchange, or they could be ants in an ant hill, or they could be uh, a, a human civilizations. By now there are millions of agent-based models or multi-agent simulations, and that um, computational paradigm is used to describe something which is called a complex adaptive systems. That is that if you put a lot of agents together, you let them interact, something happens, and what happens typically is a self-organization. So these are the, I would say, the hard science versions, but now also in the soft sciences, in the social sciences, and in the humanities. Since recently, there is also this paradigm of what I call networked agents. And maybe the most famous one is called actor network theory, which was originally proposed by a well-known philosopher, sociologist, Bruno Latour. And what he did is he was analyzing complex evolutions. Like, for example, uh, how did we first get nuclear energy? And then when he analyzes that, he notices that it's not just a question of the right person on the right moment, but that person depends on other people, depends on institutions, depends on availability of resources, depends on the available of technologies. And all of these elements, the technologies, the institutions, the people, the knowledge, he calls actors, which is basically another term for agents. And 
all of these depend on each other. So you have these networks of agents. And the interesting thing of this approach is that, unlike a typical social science approach, agents don't need to be people. They don't need to be social. They can be objects. They can be ecosystems. They can be trees. They can be rivers. So Latour has also uh, uh, proposed an idea which he calls the parliament of things. If we really want to understand the global system, in a sense, we should not only give a voice to humans, but also to things, because the things, the rivers, the mountains, the sea, they also have a stake. They also are interacting with us, so we should give them a voice somehow. And then another approach which I have a bit ambivalent feeling about, it's an approach in the humanities, it's called post-humanism. And the idea is to be not anthropocentric. That means not like traditional social science to take the individual human as the final arbiter of everything, but to say there are not only humans, there are technologies, there are ecosystems, there are animals, there are plants, and you can't really necessarily say what is human, what is not human. All of these things are blurred. These are some ongoing trends in sciences, both the social sciences or the hard sciences. They are moving towards this agent-based modeling. They are moving towards network. But these approaches as yet are fragmentary. They use different terminologies. They have different perspectives. They have different value systems. So what I try to do is to provide what is called an ontology. An ontology is kind of a philosophy of the most fundamental concepts, the building blocks of your conceptual framework, the building blocks of your theory. And if you can represent this formally, and by formally I mean mathematically or by computer simulations, then you have the basis for a real scientific model. And that is what I call the relational agency. So just to give you a very quick taste of how this formal language would look, the formal language consists of a number of elements, which are what I call conditions, A, B, C. And A could be anything that you can distinguish the presence from the absence. A could mean that there is a particular type of elementary particle, or a particular type of molecule, or a particular type of organism, or some particular weather condition, or some particular social condition, doesn't matter. And then, Conditions change, so it's a process ontology that means the essence is changed. Things appear or disappear. So a condition can appear, a condition can disappear, a condition can be transformed into another condition. And then most interesting, a combination of condition is transformed into a new combination of conditions. And then you get this notation A plus B gives C plus D. That's a typical notation using chemistry for a chemical reaction. And then you get to a formalism that is called reaction networks. And these then can be analyzed mathematically. So I don't have the time here to tell you how it's analyzed, but I want to give you just one intuitive example. An ecosphere as depicted there is something you can buy over the internet. It's a kind of a self-contained aquarium that means it's a glass bowl with water and plants and animals in there, and it's completely closed off. Nothing goes in, nothing goes out, except light. So it consists of algae, the greenish things, the reddish things are shrimps, and then invisible, there are bacteria. And how does it work? You can represent it with these kind of reactions. Instead of A, B, A plus B gives C plus D, I now write shrimps plus algae plus oxygen produce shrimps plus waste plus carbon dioxide plus heat. Bacteria plus waste plus oxygen, that means the bacteria and the waste together and the oxygen together, the bacteria will turn the waste into nutrients while producing carbon dioxide and heat. And finally, the algae, together with the light, do photosynthesis. They use <clears throat> the nutrient produced by the bacteria. They use the carbon dioxide, turn it back into oxygen, and they multiply so that the shrimps have more algae to eat. So what the whole system shows is that it is self-maintaining or self-producing, or what some call autopoietic. The whole system is producing itself. The algae are being eaten by the shrimps. The shrimps produce waste, the bacteria turn the waste 
into nutrients which make the algae grow again and the whole thing is self-contained. Now, this is the small-scale version, but the large-scale version is simply the Earth. The Earth is one very big ecosphere, and now I don't have specifically algae and shrimps. I have animals and plants, and basically it's the same equations. Uh, you can describe it in just the same way as this small ecosphere, but of course, this is a very simple model. If I want to make it more detailed, I can start putting on different types of animals and different types of plants, and I can calculate how fast the reactions go. So in theory, you could make a very detailed scientific model like that, starting from something very simple and then make it gradually more complex. So then what's then the major evolutionary transition? Well, the agents are the things that perform the reactions. Like, for example, the shrimps will turn the algae into waste and to carbon dioxide. So the shrimps, in this case, are the agents. In another reaction, it's the bacteria that are the agents. In another reaction, it's the algae that are the, the agents. But all these agents are mutually adapted. They are living symbiotically. That means they need each other synergetically the shrimps wouldn't be able to survive without the algae and without the bacteria, and the bacteria wouldn't be able to survive without the algae and the shrimps. And so, so all the different uh, agents in this network are depending on each other, which means that together they form a system as a whole, and that system as a whole I could now describe as a super agent. And the super agent also has a certain input and a certain output. In the case of an ecosphere, the input is minimal light and the output is also minimal heat. But I can use this kind of framework to look at different granularities and I don't need to have strict boundaries. I can say this subset of reactions and agents is mutually adapted, so they form a super agent. But I can do it at the different levels of granularity. So it's a little bit the difference with the group selection that David speaks about, when David speaks about group selection, he's speaking about agents that are all the same types of organisms, they're all members of a group, all people are in a group. Here I'm speaking about agents that can be very different. People as agents need plants and they need animals and they need technologies. All these agents together are mutually uh, adapted. And that is the idea of the relational agency that by making these kind of models of reactions where you see how agents interact and mutually adapt, you can explain all kinds of things. So, for example, the origin of life from molecules, that's what we are now trying to model in our origin of goal directedness uh, project. With computer simulations, we are hoping to show how autopoietic systems that are adaptive will emerge out of these kind of reactions. The classical example, multicellular organisms from cells, and of course the noosphere from individuals, but that's just the foundation. I haven't yet gone that far to really model how it happens. And then finally, some ethical implications of this relational agency view. The relational agency view is you have different agents and agents produces something that challenges one other agent to act in turn, which may challenge other agents to act in turn. The whole thing stabilizes only when what all the agents together are doing is producing synergy. When they get into some kind of a cycle where everything, every agent gets what it needs and produces what the others need, then you get a self-stabilization, that's the when you get synergy. And that is indeed what you see, the self-organization is creating this synergy. But it doesn't always work, like in the case of Ukraine and Russia. Obviously, they have, there you have the opposite of synergy, what I call friction, which is that instead of the agents helping each other to go, they're helping each other to, to diminish or to die. Uh, so the value implied by that is that you should try to seek synergy with the agents you're interacting with and avoiding friction, where friction is the opposite. Friction is where you take something that the other one needs. Synergy is where you produce something that the other one needs. And actually, uh, earlier in our group, uh, we developed a model called an offer network. And 
I think I should pick that up again because we, we left it a little bit. Offer network is the idea that you use the internet to create these kind of synergies. An offer network is you advertise all the things you are willing to give, all the things that you would like to get, and then there is some mediating system that will try to find intermediate agents so that, for example, I have an old bike I don't need anymore, but I would like to get an aquarium. Well, maybe somewhere there's somebody who can take my bike and maybe somebody else can give me an aquarium. And the offer network tries to balance the whole and to create the whole synergy so that the whole system that all the agents uh, uh, participate. These are what I call the local values, the agents locally trying to become synergetic. And then globally is, if we look now at the global level of the whole uh, noosphere, well, this noosphere should become self-maintaining, should become resilient, and that requires some degree of noospheric consciousness. By noospheric consciousness, I mean the consciousness of what's going on in the global system and that consciousness uh, well, I, I suppose I don't have time to explain our model of noospheric consciousness, but it's, it's an idea of kind of <coughs> circulating patterns of thoughts that become self-stabilizing. And uh, the problem is, uh, like in all evolutionary systems, you can have uh, parasites, uh, free riders, uh, selfish systems, that means systems that go at the expense of the other systems. Typically, that's what the cancer does. The cells in a cancer go faster than the other cells, but by doing that, they exhaust the reserves of the neighboring cells, and in the end, they kill the organism of which they are part. So, part of the global values will also be to become aware of all these kind of Selfish thought system, that means thought systems that go at the expense of others. And I would give examples like forms of nationalism, like the Russian nationalism at the moment, forms of fundamentalism, forms of populism, forms of conspiracy. Theory. All these kind of thought systems that consider all other thought systems as bad and their own thought system as the only good one. And therefore, they are in a reaction of friction rather than one of synergy. Uh, so, I mean, this was kind of a brief view of first what we have done and then uh, what we are still working on.